performers. So it's a different world, but I think there's definitely it's not it was, it, people love it. So you know, and I love it sometimes. I would go and watch somebody. The skills like Roger Sanchez, the skills he has when I watch him, and I love it when he does stuff with my voice and people like that. I would could watch him all day. I love watching him at Cafe Mambo and places. And I quite often cry when I watch a DJ like Roger mixing my voice. I, I cried at one when he did it in Manchester. He opened his set with my acapella, and I just cried because what what um, an amazing thing for him to do for me because to play in my hometown at the Albert Hall here and start with um, the acapella to reach out be. I was like, <laughs> and he looked up at me and he was, he was laughing because I was crying. <laughs> but it's sweet. Well, that's what some of us do. We uh, we honor our singers because we come from that generation. We know we know how important all you are. So understanding your your background with politics and your mom when does this music thing begin for you um as well, i kept winning the talent competitions but to, that wasn't to... really it, it was uh, unfortunately we're at 16 uh, so 15 i was winning all these talent competitions and then i started doing clubs because i met just met my ex-husband at 16 so it just all went wrong i won a big talent competition uh, where i'd have to travel to denmark and somewhere else and get this manager but I just couldn't do it because I just met my ex-husband and I was 16. So for five years, really, it took five years of my life, really, away from music. And then I started again at 21 um, because I was um, I was in a really, really terrible relationship. So I went to Women's Aid Refuge with my kids um, for five months. And it's it's not it's not a pleasant, you know, it's not it's not the nicest place to be. But I got out of it. Um, I got a house with help, the help from the Women's Aid. I don't even have Women's Aid over there, there for women who've been battered. Um, we do, but right. it's not called that. It's... Um, yeah, no, I, I know. You won't be called that. The shelter. So, it's, it's, they put you in a yeah, shelter, the shelter for battered women. The, yeah, yeah. So, and these are the names for them here, but the best one here was Women's Aid and Refuge. And, yeah, and so you're living with eight other women and the children for five months until you're rehoused. Um, with nothing, no clothes for the kids, nothing. Started again. And then I got a job, the only job I've ever got apart from singing, I got a job in a bar to meet people because I'd changed area because I had to leave my husband. So I got a job in a bar in the centre of Manchester and worked there for about five weeks. I was so bad as a barmaid. I just singing, I was just singing and one for myself, getting myself a drink of whiskey, which is my drink. <laughs> and I was like, and I was just enjoying myself because I'd lost all my childhood for five years and my mum was babysitting every night. And yeah, so I did four nights a week. I'd work in this bar. And then somebody heard my voice singing behind the bar. Who's said, this? You, he's called Dave Rofe, this guy. And he ended up managing a band called Doves, who are big over here. And he said, he said, um, can you be on this record? We've got these two guys that have done these tunes. They're called Vanilla Soundcore. And you'd sound great on their record. I went, oh, yeah. And I went on the, in the studio the next day. And then we did, I think we recorded two songs. I wrote them with them just wrote them without even thinking house tunes and then the they came out on white labels and and then one came out on his label dfm but they were getting in the ring record mirror and sounds magazine the reviews for these records were incredible from people like mike pickering and there was one from i don't know if it was arthur baker there was one from somebody else they were loving this tune back where we belong by vanilla soundcore and who is this girl and then I did a gig in the place called The Boardwalk in Manchester and I was just drunk and I was sat on the stage and my tights got stuck to the stage but I thought I was a proper little punk and I was just just very drunk I could still sing and I just sang these songs but everyone just went, oh, she's mad. This is amazing. He's mad. And um, yeah, and this guy called Bruce Mitchell who was doing the lights and he ended up a bit of a legend over here factory in the factory records. He... Um, he was a, a really well-known drummer over here. And he told Simply Red's manager, I've just seen this girl who's a superstar. And so Simply Red's manager the next day got in contact with me. And this is before mobile phones. It was all messages to mess. I thought it was just a joke. I was getting a message sent to me. Somebody rang my house phone and left a voicemail message. And I was like, this is a joke saying, ring this number. Elliot Rashman from Simply Red's manager wants to, it's a joke, this. And, um... Yeah, and it wasn't a joke. He, he signed signed me up the next day and just said, you are, you're incredible. Um, I couldn't believe it. And and his office was next door to Happy Monday's office. And so it just all connected and ended up just loving Happy Mondays. And because I was managed by Elliot, I could go and sit in the ex-office. And then there was a bit of a, a, um, a bidding war for my publishing. 
which I couldn't believe. We were in a chapel and with Virgin. And I'd only written three songs. And I was like, oh my God, there's a bidding war for me. And it's like, I've literally just got rehoused. I've got hardly anything. You know, I don't need much, as I said. I've got my two children. I'm just, I've only just, as I say, because I was in the home, I only just come off benefits, really, as a single parent. And then all of a sudden, I'm signed by Elliot and I've got a publishing deal where they're going to give me something like £20,000. They were just arguing. Started at 20 and then somebody said, right, you're going to Virgin, then going to the next one, we'll say, they've offered you 20, so we'll get 25 of them. I was like, oh my God. And literally, and it's the house I still live in, I was able with that publishing money to put a deposit on a house, a really nice house, to bring my kids up in, in 1990. And, you know, and it's just, I couldn't believe it. I'd left my husband in 1987. And by the end of 1989, I'm buying a house, got a publishing deal with Warner Chapel. I couldn't believe it. And I didn't know, but I was about to sing with Happy Mondays as well, because that's what I decided to set my sights on. And, um, yeah, and it was great. But because I joined Happy Mondays, I didn't really that you never were looking to get into the music industry yet, right? No, i just come out of a Bastard Wives song. I was still yeah, in the Bastard Wives song when I sang that vocal. I want you to be I couldn't clear. believe it. I just sang on this tune with some unknown lads, Vanilla Soundcore. Um, he, one of them's done really well now, um, Roger Lyons. He tours with Kaiser Chiefs and um, a few other people. Uh, but I just bring me the, the horizon, I think they're called, it works with now, a new order we were with. But at the time, we were, they were just two young lads. And we did two or three songs. That's all I'd written. And I'm given a publishing deal off the back of that because probably because Elliot had said, thought I was a superstar. And he's like, he just had a baby though. So his head went a bit. So he was, didn't really, he wasn't really managing me as he should. So I was like, I just, I didn't know what to do, but I just, I saw Happy Mondays on the TV, on a TV show with Tony Wilson. And I just decided I want to join them. You know, forget about any potential I have as a solo artist. I couldn't, because I've never been ambitious like that. I just do what I love, you know, and I'm not, it's, I don't think of career and money. I'm trying to be better now, but, you know, before it's just, it could be too late. But it's it's not that, it's just, I'm just m- more about um, what's right, you know, doing what's right. That's what I am about with my career now. What's right, and I want to work with the people I want to work with. I was with Carl Cox in Brighton, and I was saying to his man- manager now, I really want to do something with Carl. He said, oh, yeah, just give us a ring or give us a, give us a message, because that's how I think it is best to do it. I don't have people to contact people. And I just, when you get a good vibe of people and you love the stuff, I just, sometimes it takes me a lot to ask people. And I usually get asked to work with them, not the other way around. But um, yeah, I'm just, as I say, I've never, I think I've done it for the right reasons. I just love singing. I love music. I love writing the songs. But I've never thought, oh, when I was, I just couldn't believe I got a publishing deal with Warner Chapel and a load of money for it. I was like, literally off the back of three songs. And I was still so you got your house. So, so you got the house. Right it put the deposit on my house, uh, like, which was a really nice house. And my kids went to grammar school because we're in a nice area. You know, and it really wouldn't have been like that. You know, it could have been really, really the other way around. And it meant that everybody respected me and my children growing up. And, you know, instead of me being a single parent, you know, in a really bad area, it, we, we, they live in, you know, I still live there. I've never wanted to move. And um, it's near the airport, though, so I do get to travel away a lot. But I just, I just, um, it came really when I needed it, you know. And I, I've been, had such a terrible time for five years. I mean, I can't even tell you. And no encouragement when we're singing. I mean, I love my mum, but it's like, I just think sometimes, mum, you could have said that sounds nice. And she did when I started doing the clubs, but only when everybody would say, your daughter's amazing, which, you know, and it went, you know, it's, there's lots of times when she didn't really turn up to watch me at school plays. And, cause, but when, when the school realised I could sing, they started to put musicals around me. The school that didn't want me in the choir, once they realised I had this voice and that people went, wow, they started to do... The, the, I did this, this musical, Trouble in Tahiti, which was really basically me and four other people. It was all about me playing this role of Dinah because of my voice. The, it was a jazz opera and it was amazing. And... You know, and it's just, yeah, the musicals were just, I did two big ones. And then there was one where it was about Noah in the Ark and I was God. And it was like, I was, they, they did it because I, they knew I'd be a good God. So it's just, so I had this confidence boost. So to go from nothing to then loads of confidence. And that's been my life like all the way around, really. But um, it's like, even now I still think, why don't people credit me still? You know, but I mean, people are starting to say, be good to get Rowetta on one of your records, which is really nice. But that didn't happen for years. It's only just happening now. 
And it's just, I don't understand. It. Maybe it's because I didn't have a good manager. Maybe maybe wow. he's me thinking, um, you don't need a manager. Maybe you do sometimes. But I just never found the right one. I've been ripped off so many times, like a lot of us have in this industry. So it made me really, really wary of it happening again. So I'd rather than be ripped off, just not be a multimillionaire. Just I'm always working out now the lockdown's over and I'm happy with that. And I'm working with some of the biggest, biggest names in the world, which is incredible. And I'm just, you know, I'm really happy with that. So eventually I think it's, um, it's at last, it's leveling okay. itself out. I'm starting to have a really, people are crediting me more and knowing who I am. You having me on the show is amazing. Um, but it's like, it's Frankie Knuckles knew my voice, but not me until he met me. And it's like, he's just oh, really upset me and he's saying we should work together. But then it's too late to work with him because he's passed. And, he's, you know, we should have known, it, it should have happened already. We got on so well, but it's because he didn't know that that was me. And it's like, it's just, it's sad for me that I don't get to work with, you know, hopefully I'll work with the people I want to. That's the most important thing. And it's not always going to be, it's not always going to work with everybody you want to work with. It doesn't always work. It's not always a great tune. I'm sorry about my dog barking. Jay, shh. But, um, yeah, it's, um, I just, I, just sometimes it's nice to even know people. You know, I'm, I'm glad to have met you today. It gives, gives me a buzz. You know, your energy is just absolutely. Jay, stop it. <laughs> It's infectious. Not like your barking. Stop it, Jay. Yeah, no. So thank you for having me on again. Oh yeah, no, no. My pleasure. Um let me make let me let me let me roll back a little bit because you, you around 1990 in the 90s begin, you buy the house and the kids are now settled into a good grammar school and you get yeah. the job with the happy Mondays. Yeah. Where does this take you on the journey? As far well, as musically speaking, I saw the Happy Mondays on a TV show and decided I want to sing with this band. They didn't weren't looking for a girl. The manager said we're not looking for a girl. So it took me six months, maybe four months, before I joined the band because they couldn't see it. And I gave the manager a ticket to come and see me, and he said, "Wow, you're madder than them." And I don't know what I'd done that night. And it so it worked. So I joined the band and then toured the world. We t came did Sound Factory in 1990 in New York. One of my favourite ever gigs. It's actually on YouTube. Call the Cops is the name of the, the actual gig. Um, Delight was supporting with Bootsy Collins. It was just the, the most incredible place I'd ever been. Certainly my favourite place in New York. I'd been to New York before, but never been anywhere like that that I loved so much and felt just, I just loved it. It was just the atmosphere. I think it actually kicked off later on in the night with with our lot, with our, our lot against whoever, but... Um, up till then, it was a great, great night. It was absolutely rammed as well. People were around the block queuing to get into this gig. And you can see in the video of it, I know it's not a huge, huge place, but the atmosphere, for us to come over there, I mean, happy when it's not world famous stars or anything, but, you know, we were doing well in the clubs in America. Did a six-week tour, eight-week tour, all over the place, LA Palladium, I think. And it was just incredible because this had gone from me wanting to be in the band and you're more of a cult indie band to the first song I sang with him became a hit in the UK, Step On, straight on, straight to number five, on top of the pops, and couldn't believe it. This is like a small band I thought was joining, but then we're in all the magazines, and like we're not the prettiest band in the world. I couldn't believe what we're in. We're in those magazines where normally you get really good-looking people in them that look really shiny, and I didn't think we were that kind of band, but we got it. We did all that, and um, yeah, and it was great. And we did Rock in Rio with Prince. Um, Aha, who else? George Michael. But this is Happy Mondays playing these places is amazing and doing all the festivals around the world. So it was great. But then we split up in the end of 92 and officially 93 and split up due to drug problems and stuff within the band and fallouts. And yeah, so it was really, really sad. All of a sudden it just all ended really abruptly, which was a good thing as a mother because I started to have to stay at home and be a mum for a bit. So it's good that the kids got to see me and stuff. Because I'd been, I'd been, we didn't do really long tours apart from in the American tour, we, which was six or seven weeks. We didn't, that was the longest tour we'd ever done. We usually only used to go away about two weeks at a time. Um, so I did see quite a lot of them, but I, I was in party mode when I was in Happy Mondays. You know, I had to go to Hacienda at least four times a week. The kids were in bed, but, you know, the next day I was all, oh, a bit woozy the next morning. But, um, yeah, but, but they were growing and everything. And I made sure, as I say, they did the homework and did all that. So, but it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was probably the right time to have a break because it was all just imploding. This whole 
the band was just, and the record label, it was all factory records. It was just um, a really bad, bad time, really. It just got too much. And the fame, when you know, when people change, when the famous and stuff, the egos, it was all a bit, oh! And, you know, now we're still together now. We're back together now, rather, after 31 years. Only one person's not in the band now. And everybody's getting along better because they're not all on different stuff. Everybody's calmed down, settled down and not addicted. Well, they might be still addicted, but they just don't do. People are addicted to anything. Don't touch that thing anymore. So, you know, I, I, I'm lucky I'm not an addict, um, but I'm, I've been surrounded by addicts a lot of my life. So um, I just, it's, it's difficult. So when addiction's out of your life, even when it's your friends, it makes life a whole lot easier. Um, well, that's the thing. You wouldn't be here if you were an addict. Either you'd be dead you know, or, definitely. You'd, or you'd be out of the business, completely out of yeah, the business. Yeah, but well, there's, there's a couple of, couple of people in the Happy Mondays. They're definitely addicts. Sean's a heroin addict known to be. and he's, But he met the right woman at the right time, cleaned him up, sorted him out. And I think it's probably about... But it's certainly 12 years I've been back with the band. He's never touched anything while I've been back with the band for 12 years. Um, or oh, since 2012, actually, so it's less than that. But yeah, he's not touched drugs for years. So it's fantastic, fantastic place to be when you see people come through it. You know, one of one of our guys, um, his brother, Paul, lives in L.A. When he did his rehab in L.A. and everything, and he's clean as anything. You know, he's fantastic, doesn't drink or anything, because you can't, some people. That's but, the, the problem. The Right. Yeah, well, it's not a problem for them now because, I mean, we thought it would be a problem, but because they've been off drugs and drink for so long, it's fine now. All it is is to make me feel guilty if I have a little drink of whiskey because it's like, are you sure you need another one? But yeah, no, it's only after the shows. You just, we, because I, I travel with the band everywhere and so I get on the bus, but everyone's cool. We just, we know each other so well, it's family. So I'm just so lucky to have this family. We all understand each other know each other well and um, yeah it's great I'm just so proud of them though to have come through it you know and a couple of them they're on all the every tv show going doing well on the reality tv because it makes a lot of money and they enjoy it so sure. good for them I like doing music more but at the moment you never know you never say never to these tv things as I say it's this famey thing it's not really for me I don't think I, I think people know too much about everybody all the time now um and I like to keep so you know keep something to yourself I don't do pictures of my children all the time on the internet, things like that, or inside my house, because that's like showing off. Um, so, yeah, and sometimes it's better to say no, I think. After the Happy Mondays, you part ways. Yeah. What's, what's the tactic for you at this point? Because now we're around 93, I think, right? Somewhere around yeah. We got well, a lot. Warner Chapel, Warner Chapel set me up with a lot of writers um, to write. Just never, nothing ever really happened, really. And, um, I did. I had a record deal with Perfecto, Paul Oakenfold's label, but just just never got anything done. I don't even know why. It was a lot more, lot different though. Then it was. We, I, I, think I didn't get a mobile phone until 1999. Definitely, I remember getting my phone in 99. So everything was hard work when you didn't have a mobile because we didn't have mobile phones. We couldn't just send your vocal over to anybody like I can now. You had to be in the studio all the time with the people to write stuff and. I just never got anything done. I was just, I was put with writers, but they were never the right ones. Uh, I was put with people, maybe they were too poppy. I didn't do much house music, and I think I should have done more house music then. Um, and I've been sampled by them quite a lot. But it, again, it was before the internet or anything. It was, it's really weird to think, but 1992, 93, we weren't sending emails to people. We didn't have mobile no, phones. There was no email. No. There was I, no think, um, I think I think Happy Mondays manager may have had a mobile phone, but it was it was huge, one of the really big ones, and we was the only. And I I, I remember I got mine because I got the Happy Mondays reformed first time in '99, and me and Sean, I remember we went and bought our mobile phones, and I thought I don't want one because my mum will be able to ring me up when I don't want to come home, you know, and say where are you, and I don't want I don't want to somebody to know where I am all the time when the baby sits, even though she's babysitting for me. Sometimes I like to have a late night. And then, um, yeah, so it's, so didn't want one, but I got one in 99. And then I got my kids them in 99. So I remember, and it was life-changing really, but for music, it was life-changing. Before then, I think I struggled because of that. You know, when you're waiting for some, you're always waiting for studios to be, and somebody to book. And then it's relying on people all the time, which is why I love now. I don't have to wait for someone to come and record my vocal or, I just do it and send it. Um, so, yeah, it was just, I just, I don't think as well, I don't think, 
I don't think I ever connected with anybody musically brilliantly. I, I did with one guy and put two years into working with him, um, Mick Jones, he was called, and we, and we worked together for two years, but he ended up really, really low all the time. So it ended up being a counselling session every time we got together. It seemed to be me counselling him because he's split with his girlfriend or, you know, his drink problem or, the, you know, something. And it's like, I ended up feeling more like his mother than, you know, a writing partner. So it was just difficult. So... Yeah, but I think there's a the right time, isn't there? Because, you know, there's a the right time for things to happen. And then when the Mondays reformed in 99, it was it was a great time. We reformed and then split up. Um, we had a really bad argument in 2000. But then there was a film 24-hour party people came out. Oh. Michael Winterbottom directing. And he said he wanted to come and meet me, but he wanted to do some research with me. He wanted me on the set to do research, make sure they were getting it right with the characters. And then when he spent the day with me, he said, I said, why don't connect? He said, I said, who's playing me? And he went, do you know what? You can actually play yourself. I was like, really? And so, yeah, so I played myself. First and- acting gig. Your first acting yeah. gig. Play you. Well, yeah, a big one with Michael Winsbottom. He's done, he's done things with Angelina Jolie, Kate Winslet, you know what I mean? And he got me. But no, it's, um, it's a great film, though, about the Manchester music scene, about Tony Wilson, who I love so much. And... Um, yeah, so and it went to Cannes, it ended up being nominated for a Palm Door and everything. So we got to do a gig in Cannes with the pretend Happy Mondays. And it, we didn't win the Palm Door, but we were up there. It's good to be nominated and good to be there. Um, but it was it was just I just had so much fun. I think I was only needed for about five days, but I was there on the set every day for eight weeks and I loved it. And and I would go to premieres. I ended up meet, uh, meeting and singing um with people, lots of big people from America and all sorts because of that film. Um, yeah, because of Michael Winterbottom, because he used to have parties in his office every Thursday, and you get the most like the Shawshank Redemption, Tim Robbins. So he's, he did a film with Michael Winterbottom after our film, and he came to the office and and he started singing Jersey Girl, Tom Waits, and I'd never heard Jersey Girl before. No Jersey Girl, sing it for us. Na 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 na, cause I'm in love with a Jersey Girl. Na, na, na. I never heard it. So I start singing, Tim Robbins starts singing it with a guitar because um, his, his wife at the time, Susan Sarandon, or his girlfriend, I don't think it was his wife, but she's from Jersey, New Jersey, I think, and he's singing this song because Tom Waits is his friend. And so I sing along with him and we ended up doing it twice because it was so good. But I don't know the words of it. I've never heard the song before, but the harmonies were incredible. And really, I'm thinking, it's Tim Robbins from The Shosh. He's one of my favourite films. You know, and, and I love Morgan Freeman as well. But Shosh and Redemption is one of my favourite films. But because I didn't Me go, ah, ah, and I acted normally, and I just sang with him. It was amazing. We just had this incredible night. And then we did this um, for the uh, rap party. We sang at the rap party again. And we also did My Girl by The Temptations. And so doing stuff like that is... is it's not nothing about fame. There were no cameras back then, camera phones and stuff. But what great memories to have, you know, because all because of my voice, really, and because of, you know, the people getting along with people is a big thing as well. And Michael Winsbottom, I love, and is is the producer of the film, Andrew. He now produces The Crown, which is massive. I think it's massive over there as well. Oh so yeah, you know, yeah. So Andrew and his Andrew Eaton, still the same person, still normal. Partied with him every Thursday. I, I just I now want a part in the crown, but I think there's only Megan I could play, isn't there? <laughs> She's only the only black one, isn't it? So I'd have to play Megan. So yeah, I'm gonna ask him gonna be in the crown. I'm too old to play Megan. <laughs> yeah, I'm joking. But no, they're just they just proper family, honestly. They took me to Venice Film Festival with another film, Code 46, because I just got along with them. You know, they're going, Do you wanna come along to this? You know, and I was singing quite a few of the films and it's nice. So don't know I've got to there. But that's what I did in, say, 2000, 2001. That got me to there. But all those years between Happy Mondays, you breaking up, were you performing still live gigs too to earn money? So you were yeah, constantly yeah, but, performing? Yeah, but not not really to I didn't make loads of money, but we were doing... I was working with this guy that I worked with for two years. We were doing... I did a few bands. I was in a band called Pleasure. So I was writing songs. I'm just... I've only not gone into it. We, do, we were doing gigs and being paid. On the back, really, of me being in Happy Mondays. So we get a crowd there, to be honest. And the Manchester scene was still pretty big, but it, it was quite local. We just do London and Manchester. Um, yeah, but I didn't do. I actually did some house music gigs with DJs, but just not loads. Um, yes, yeah, so we didn't do lots and lots, but yeah, we did little tours, trying to make it really. 
Um, they didn't pay loads. But if we did get any money, yeah, it would just be off the back of the Happy Monday's name, really. Um, so so it would be Loretta, Loretta Satchel from the Happy Yes, it was featuring. We're not Satchel. I never use my surname. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Loretta. Loretta. Yeah, obviously they'd make a big thing. And we'd get interviews because of it. And we'd get, you know, mentioned. And so that was good. I did a bit of TV stuff, did little bits of things, but just not loads. Because, um, again, I couldn't really do anything to be famous because I was in, not in hiding, but I've been in a women's aid refuge. I didn't want to be. I didn't want my husband to come and find me, to be honest. So it's a really oh. difficult place to be. It's See, that's... The whole truth. That's what, one of the things that's been holding me back a lot. I go... I'd, yeah, even with the Happy Mondays, I wouldn't do any interviews back in, you know, when it, the first time around, I, w- I was, I'm in very few pictures um, because I wouldn't do any pictures. Well, that's and why, was, now we know why we couldn't find you. Now I've just been uh, waiting to understand why, because they said we all knew which singers were doing what because they were pushing yeah. themselves, for, even with no. I, I totally forgot about that. But well, that was subconsciously because it's like people would say, why weren't you going in any pictures? Uh, and they wanted to. And I wanted to do interviews, but it, I couldn't. So how, how would you going... handle that? And how would you handle that? Say if I was an interviewer coming and saying to the Happy Mondays, you know, to the management, hey, we would like to get Rowetta, or we'd like to get, because you probably didn't even know your name, we'd like to, like to get the yeah. female lead singer and the male lead singer and the whole band together. And what yeah, would you they always like the front people, so quite often they would, but the manager knew that I didn't want to do interviews because of what the reason. Everybody knew. And also we had security at our gigs. If you ever see... A black guy who looks like this, in particular, that you don't know, they have to really make sure he is with someone who's got a valid pass, just in case it's my ex. You know, you've got to be careful. And it was it was, it was, was really horrible time, really, because you can't enjoy the little bit of success and fame. Because a lot of, when you were saying, what did I do in those years after Happy Money's, I had earned quite a bit. I didn't go out spending loads, and I'd earned quite a bit of money doing it during Happy Monday's time. And, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd, we did do a lot of massive venues, you know, the arenas over here. Um, so when we when we reformed again in 99, we we played with Oasis. We got a lot of money for playing Wembley Stadium and Murrayfield Stadium. That's what I'm saying. You had yeah, to so, I, so, so I didn't need to get a, a job job. I'd, you know, I'd, I'd earned. It's like, it's like at the beginning of lockdown, I'd just done a 30-day tour, so I'd earned money. It's just you do get taxed on it all and everything, but I'd earn money. You have to, you've got your mortgages to pay and stuff and your bills, but I could afford to live without having to do anything ridiculous like silly records or work with people I didn't want to or get a proper job. There was times when my mum said, you know, I, you know, I know she had a boyfriend who said, Rowetta needs to get a proper job. And it's like, I can't though, because if, you got, if I got a proper job, I would give it up the minute I get a singing, anything singing. It's right, very difficult. You're back on the road, baby. I'm back. Yeah, I'm it's, back it's like I'm if you get a job, the minute the minute if I I've never never had a job about okay. one barmaid job in the refuge. But if I got a job, I, I would have to let people down, and I'm not really a let people down kind of person. I come on time, I t- you know, I, I do me do my job. So if I promise to work with somebody for six weeks, it's like I can't do I can't present a radio show, which I love talking and doing radio. I do a lot of radio filling in for people. But you can only do really once a week. I did one five days a week for a while for Gadio a few years ago. And I managed to do three years and a quiet time. So I was being a radio presenter. But the minute I started singing a lot again, the radio presenting had to go because I can't. I have music. I love radio presenting as well, but music. I can't, so I can't do anything else because I just give it all up the minute and I get a sniff of a gig and go in. Okay. Rowetta, how scary was it for you to deal with? The fame is exciting. Mm. I'm not the fame, but I know you missed success. Yeah. But the other part is you're worried about the ex. Yeah. How bad was this fear for you during this time period? You have young kids and you're trying to balance to stay out there in the forefront, but yet yeah. you're trying to be behind a curtain too at the same time to hide. What's life like that for you at that time? It's horrible. It's really horrible. I was, and I was drinking too much, I think, because of it. I was really, and I'm not an alcoholic, but I was drinking too much to just party all the time and be a different personality. Because really, absolutely, it's the fear is, is terrible. And if you let the fear get to you, you'd have to stop. You know, and there was no, there was no um, I actually did a, a TV program in the end over there in Malibu because I thought no one will watch it because celebrity rehab, where they talked, and it sorted me out though. 
I was addicted. I was actually addicted to watching the American version, and then they paid me quite a bit of money to go to Malibu and do the UK version on a really a small channel over here that nobody would watch. So I did that in a place called Passages, and it was amazing. Not for any, because I'm not an alcoholic. I had to sort of push the bit that I drink a lot. But my problem was I'd not got sorted out this abuse that had carried on for a long time, and I needed it. And my dad passing and stuff like that. So you do need to talk about it sometimes, and it really helped me. Um, and I stayed. We did two weeks with cameras on, but we were allowed to stay for two weeks without, and that's what I did. And it once the cameras had gone, that's when it was really, really great. You know, just these. I mean, there was just some. I was with Les McCoon from the Bay City Rollers, and there's um. Oh, I tell you, my roommate was Victoria Sellers, who I love. Victoria Sellers, Peter Sellers does from Brit Eklund, and so we were roommates, and we were like sisters. We just loved each other. Hang, we on, just sat- hang on, everybody. Peter Sellers, just got to tell you, because our age is going to show now. Peter oh, yeah. Sellers was the original Pink Panther. He's talking about the daughter of the Pink Panther. Go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry. And, and, and so we just, but we were in Celebrity Rehab for a TV show over here. And we were, me and Victoria were addicted to the American version with Kanicki from Greece. Because I love Kanicki from Greece, but it, it, I mean, it, was, it was sad what happened to him in the end. But we used to just love that. But the first thing in the morning, we're doing some kind of therapy. It was, it was really, we th- I thought it was just, just for the TV cameras at first, but it was really useful. And I came back from Malibu feeling totally refreshed and because I'd let it all out. It was just talking to somebody about it because I'm not had I didn't I don't talk about I don't I'm not a down person I don't go around talking about stuff like that so I think I was covering it up with this party person and yeah and, and not really even crying about it because my kids had to be at, like a strong woman and a lot of people think I'm a strong woman but um I just have these ups and downs really and even now it feels like you're bipolar but really it's only normal really considering what I've been through it's only normal to have these extreme mood swings and feel elated on stage and then come up and feel really isolated and lonely and fearful of what could happen and I was absolutely terrified my husband wasn't going to come and shoot me while I was singing never thought stuff like that I never felt scared on stage but I was scared of him knowing where I was and you know, finding me and finding out where I live, and I've always stayed in this house because he's not found me here in this house. He still never found, he never found. No, I'm sure, he might be able to. He might be able to now. You know, it's not as important now because the kids and I've got very good security now. But I'm just saying, I do feel safe because after all them years, you know, I t- totally moved out of the area with all my friends. I didn't. I couldn't mix. I had to make new friends. Totally left my home, my clothes, my life, my furniture, my everything. And started again. And I'm dead proud that I started again and did it again. But um, I was really, I wasn't scared of losing anything either. I was scared of losing my life and my mind. And um, and I haven't. It sounds like it's almost you were like in a witness protection program, almost in a sense. Yeah. The way you, the way it is really, because they rehouse you with women's aid. They rehouse you, they help you. But you put in like a poor area. But I held off for a nice, a bit of a nicer area. It wasn't a nice, nice area, but it wasn't too rough. It wasn't. I wasn't going to let them put me on an estate that was just black people and drug addicts, which is what they do quite a lot, unfortunately. They put people of colour, or they used to, and and junkies and people like that, and trouble people that they think are trouble, criminals. They put them all in one place, and I refused to go and make an excuse of why I couldn't live in that area. I pretend I knew my husband had a friend who lived in that area, so I couldn't go. So I held off for an area that Smart. wasn't too bad. And yeah, and and it was great for a year or two. And then I got the publishing deal and was able to buy a house in a, in a really nice area. So um, yeah, it was, um, I, I, did, I, did, I did okay. And I'm really, really happy. And you know, when people go, I've no regrets. I'm glad it happened because it's made me the person I am. No, I'm not. I'm not glad it happened. And or even if I say I wouldn't have my children, I love my children. No, because but, you know what? There's children involved. No way. Yeah. I love my children, but I, w- I wish, I wish, I wish I had a different, no, you know, but, but so there's no way, no way. I, I wish that I, I wish it had all been better, but it's happened and, and we survived it. And, um, you know, and, well, and, it's, and that's true. Here. They say what, what you, what, what you survive 
doesn't kill you, you makes you stronger. Okay. Yeah, but, yeah, but you're constantly having, living. Yeah. You're constantly living with the fact that you may be dead soon. You're like, I can't. Yeah. You're constantly. I like, mean, not anymore. They, because because actually, when I went to Malibu and did that thing, that's when I had to get rid of that fear because I couldn't live. I couldn't live my life. I was I was not living as I should. I wasn't able to enjoy. I wasn't doing interviews. And I thank God that I sorted out because when social media came along, it's really helped me keep this career going. And and I love social media now because I've not got the fear. And it's obviously because the kids, my kids are in the thirties now. So obviously there's no hold on me that way. I don't have to worry about them going to school and keeping the school out of, you know, it was, um, and also because he was in prison quite a lot, not through me, through somebody else, uh, something else he'd done. So, um, yeah, so when he was in prison, I was I felt better as well. So there were times when it wasn't so bad. Now I don't care where he is. I'm not bothered. He doesn't control my life. You know, it's I left him when I was 21, and that's I'm not saying how many years, but it's loads of years ago. Was he older? Ago. Was he a lot older than you? Just four years older. Okay, and was he also a a a, a, a kid from the street? Was he was he grown? He was more, yeah, yeah. He was he was like. In his area, he was supposed to be the hardest, the you know, and and then he ended up doing heroin and stuff like that before I left him, and that's when he turned really bad. But it was bad. I, I used to blame the heroin and the drugs, but it, it was bad before. But it got worse and worse and worse. And when you've got two little, my kids are born on the same day, a year apart. So if you've got a one and a two year old, it's and I was only a kid myself, you know. I, I was only I had my first child at seventeen, my second at eighteen. They're both born on the twenty third of May, and so if you've got a one and a two year old and I left when they were two and three and went into a women's aid refuge and it's scary and we went into one bed on a top bunk but I tell you what I was sleeping that top bunk with my babies anytime and we had to sleep there for about three weeks before another bed came came available for them to share a bed underneath me but it was so worth it we used to but I was falling out of bed all the time but um and, and I'm with women that I wouldn't really choose to live with and their children some of the children had foul mouths and they were calling my children names in the playroom to do with colour and that's what you have to deal with but you just know that we're all we've all come out of a really bad relationship you know and so it does you know it does strange things some of the kids aren't going to be very well behaved because they've all suffered and it's it's trying to be tolerant and patient but it's it's really really hard but I never forgot how bad that was because I never wanted to go back into a women's aid refuge but I didn't want to be dead as well because I didn't think I'd ever go into a women's aid refuge again I thought I'd be dead and unfortunately after I left him he did find me again initially and luckily that's when I got my publishing deal was able to move I went into um, an, another refuge of a kind of homeless families one while I was waiting for this house to come up because he found me when he came out of prison and I just never ever wanted to go through that again uh, but um, but I don't want this to be a really really sad interview I want it to be happy no it's, but it's got to be real no 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 forget about it being well, it is happy. as they say every, everybody here knows but it just it got a bit much because of the internet because lots of women were contacting me saying we've been through this and they want help but it will bring me down. If I talk about it all the time and have people, I can't help everyone. I do work now with the women's aid here. But let, me explain the reason, let me explain what the show does. The show actually shows how you deal with the struggles and problems of life and how you yeah. rise. And you yeah. rise from the occasion. Exactly. And we want to, to understand the rise. I understand that. No, I think that, we, and I do it. I know. And it is important that people do that because when you've got no hope, that's when you lose it. And and I I would have loved to have heard from people I could relate to when I was in that situation, but it's really difficult. But at the end of the day, you do need to, you need to be able to talk about it. You need to know where to go. It's easier now because these contact numbers, we've got mobile. It's a lot easier to get help. Back when I had it, my husband, you know, he, he cut the wire of the phone. I couldn't contact anybody. I had no friends left. You know, I had to cut all my friends off. So it's very difficult. And the police got me out, you know, took me to a women's aid refuge because I was in hospital. They took me out. So that's the only way I got out of it. And I still was going to go back, but the police persuaded me not to. So when people say bad things about the police, I always give them a little bit of a break because they did get me out. You know, and at the end of the day, you do need, you need help, you know, Let's you know you hope that all police aren't bad. I know they're not all bad, you know. And well, I've tried to work with, let's just to put it like this: there's always a couple of bad apples that ruin the bunch. More than a not couple, every, I know. Not yeah. everybody's bad, but there is no. Thank God, thank God. Not, not just with the I mean, a good a good police person. Somebody goes into the police. It's a hard job to do anyway. If oh, you yes. go into it and you're a good person, you go to help. There's some great. I've worked with some some over here. 
um, for, we've had to do it against violence during the football, during the World Cup. And I've worked with the top, the head police people here because I'm a voice that's willing to say I've been battered. And because I can say it now because I'm not frightened of my ex-husband anymore. You know, I know whereabouts he is, you know, but I'm not got fear. I know what, I know where he is and what he's up to. But um, not everybody let's, can. Let me say so, this. Um, it takes an incredible amount of strength and positivity to even step out of that situation. People no. stay in it too and long. And they go back. And they and go they back. Go I nearly back went back. Long. I nearly and went back because because I thought the refuge was horrible. I'm not. You wasn't used to living in a house like that. You know, it, it, it's not luxury. It's, you know, it's, it's like it's difficult. It was difficult. It wasn't that though. It's more. I wasn't bothered about the place. It was more. It was a. It was a big, large, rundown house I was in. But it was more the people and the children. It was very difficult. And they were in and out. You just get used to one woman and then another woman. It's like, probably like, it's a bit like a prison. But the workers kept me going. The people who worked there, they were fantastic. And the couple of friends, the good friends that I made. And five months, honestly, by the end of it, I was, it's like you have a top dog. It really was a bit like prison. And I was like the top dog on the, on the end because I'd got my own room with my kids. I'd got a nice single bed. My kids had a bunk bed each and then I let the white girls have a sunbed over my single bed because I was the only one who had a single bed so I let them have a sunbed in my room so I, everybody loved me because they go can we use your room right for the sunbed so when it comes to moving out I didn't really want to move out at the end because you know I liked it there because like what? a lot of people like that in prison but can I can I ask you this 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 question is making me think family let's talk about family for a second because we'll go back to the music yeah. You're talking about 16 and 17 years old having kids. Why so young at that? Because you're older now and you could speak outside the box. Yeah. Why go, why start your life so young at that time? What was going on pre to that at home that made you say, ah, I'm leaving, I'm going to get married and I'm out? Because that's usually yeah. a very young age to be rolling and then to start kids, by the way. I know. Well, because. Oh, not that well, mistake. No, no, I'll be honest. I'll be honest. My, 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 my mum, my mum had my mum. Don't blame me. She had boyfriends, but she had this boyfriend that I was fourteen. He didn't like children, so she never came home every weekend. And I was fourteen because he didn't like children, so I didn't see my mum. She didn't come to the school plays, the musicals I did. So she just she she took her out of the box. I love my mum though. By the way, I love her. <laughs> she wasn't. She no, wasn't that has to do with love. That has to do with love. We're talking about yeah, the time. She just, time. as yeah, you know, and I don't. And again, every everybody's been through stuff. She's been through stuff that made like that. She just wasn't great there as a mum. So that's probably a bit why. And also because of the way she was like that, I, I started to glue sniff when this, she had this boyfriend. And I think Niall Rogers has talked about glue. Me and Niall Rogers have talked about our glue sniffing because he put in a magazine interview with W. And then on Twitter, I said, oh, my God, my friend, the drummer, he lives in Canada. He's seen this interview with Niall talking about glue snipping. And I went, I've never heard anybody speaking about glue snipping ever in, like, that's famous. That was, a big, thing, but that was a big thing during that era of the 70s. Yeah, but none of my friends got into it the way I did. America I came from Norway. Yeah, so, so I I never I never heard anyone talk about it. So he's saying on Twitter, I went, "Oh, I just read your article in in W Nile. I can't believe the glue." And he said, "I knew that's why I loved you because I've met Nile quite a few times." And he's saying because glue sniffers do not well. It's a very very dark drug to be on. But I was never addicted to anything apart from glue. And he was saying he thinks that's why he didn't get too hooked into anything else because he did glue first. Glue is the one very difficult so to do that and be able to do it remember when you do glue your mouth your breath smells of glue you've got spots around your mouth you're covered in glue but mum's furniture there was glue all over the flat she didn't know when the police brought me home after i've been doing it for about a year she was in shock the whole flat must have stunk of glue all the time me this, even the teachers knew something was wrong. I was glue sniffing every single day with my dinner money. It was only 68 pence, you know, less than a dollar to buy the bag of glue. That so he sent me, sent for about half an hour it would last. In my lunch break, dinner break, and then I would go back to school after doing it every day. And it's like, and she didn't know because I used to say I was making chairs. My uncle Michael was blind and deaf. So I pretended I was making chairs for the blind out of the wooden pegs. And she really <laughs> perfect alibi, perfect alibi. Goes, yeah, because my uncle Michael was blind and deaf, it sounded right. 
but I would never make more. There was I never even finished that one chair. I got the same chair out every time. I'm <laughs> so making the chairs. Made. I'm making the chairs. Let me show you. Said, so that's why the smell of glue. But she didn't realize it was all over the, my clothes. It was on my mouth. I had spots around my mouth all the time because I used to sniff tins of glue, Evo stick, all the time. I was a mess. So that was, luckily, when the police brought me home and she cried, that's when I stopped because she cried. I managed to, so I don't know how I stopped. And, you know, and, and I, I did it again when I was older, a little bit, but not much. I, I knew to stop, um, thank God. But that's the only thing that really got me addicted. And I think that would have been, I stopped that when I was 15, and then school obviously was a mess. I would only go in to do my musicals. I wouldn't go in for lessons. My exams are all messed up. Drama I did well. English and maths I did well because I did them a year early. The rest of my exams I just didn't even turn up. To I understand now. I understand. And my mum wasn't even. My mum didn't. I'd write letters from my mum to the school to say reasons why, and she she just agreed. So that I used to say, otherwise I'll get hit. I'll get strapped. So yeah, she took her eye off the ball. But nobody teaches you how to be a good parent. So she does love me though. It's not that. It's just yeah, she got it wrong. And those days, and that's when I met Des. Obviously, looking for love, and met my ex-husband. Must have been looking for love, but he was like not the most popular in his area. He was the hardest. We call it the cock of the cock of a place. Is the one that everyone you know, and he had the best-looking girlfriend. He was the hardest. Nobody would mess with him. And I was just you know this girl that went to a posh school as well. I had to wear a bowler hat for school with my afro underneath. And so for somebody like him to spot me, and it's because of my colour that, because there wasn't a lot of black people in the area we were from, he spotted me across somewhere in the town and just, he knew, he said, my mum will love her because of my colour. So he just, you know, took a shine to me because of that. So, you know, it's, mum would love so that's another thing. That, that's another thing. Explain that. I mean, Manchester area, Liverpool, that, that whole Midlands area, it's not many blacks... T- uh, you know, oh, there is there is now more, and we're talking about back yeah. then. We're talking yeah. about this is that this era. where I was from. Though remember, I moved to Manchester. I'm from Manchester with my mum, but I moved to an outskirt somewhere. I'm not going to say where, but with my ex-husband, where because I, I went to I, I passed an exam for this um, for a private school, and so my dad was supposed to pay the school fees because he was a politician with money. He didn't always send the money over, so that's where my mum had to get another job. Oh. But I had to go out of town to go to this school. And that's where I met my ex-husband. So that's that's the place I left. All my friends were from this area, um, but there there were very few. There were two families, two black families there. That that was it. Now there are more, as you say, because obviously they multiply because the black men like to multiply. <laughs> I was dead. <laughs> and lots of my friends have got babies my colour. Loads, of, well, loads of my friends. When I was pregnant, when I was sixteen, I was I was like I was. I think nearly everybody was, you know. And a lot of them were black, black babies, and there was only two families. <laughs> See, that's what I was trying trying to understand. And I'm glad you explained it all. It makes total sense now as to why this all. Because again, if you hear the story now of say someone talking about having children at that age, you go, "Why?" Right? If you're, you know, on the outside. But of course, there's there's a domino effect of what was going on. I didn't want children, point. though. I didn't want children. I just, I just, it was just stupid. I think. Because I was 16, I was just stupid. I know my ex-husband really wanted children, so I must have just been doing it for that. I don't, I don't, I, I was a really bright girl. I was really, I, I passed an exam for this really brilliant school, which you had to pass three exams to get in. This Berry Grammar, everybody knows this school is uh, like the top school to get in. And I was a bright girl. There's only three people passed for this in from my school. Um, three girls actually, and one of them couldn't afford it. My best friend didn't have couldn't afford it. So there's only two of us went from a whole school, and so I was clever at one point. And then I don't know. I mean, now I think I think my brain cells popped while I was glue sniffing. So I think I've lost a lot of my brain cells. No, but no I was I was, I was a, a really good. I was a, I was a really clever kid though. So I just but I love so has a, yeah, but love has a funny way of making you do crazy things. I know. Don't, and don't I must have been really looking in the wrong place, but it's because. As I say, I didn't have that family at home at all. I had nothing. I just, when my friends used to have to go in for 10 o'clock, I just never had a, nobody, I didn't have to go in at any second, go in when I want. I'd do what I want. And that's what I did. I did exactly, because my mum thought I was quite growing up for my age as well. So I, that's what she'd say. Oh, you'll be fine. So I would leave me every weekend. I'd have parties every weekend. <laughs> I had a ball, don't get me wrong. It was a really good time. But it was all just totally wrong. 
you know, and honestly, even even the blue sip, and I loved blue sip, and it was terrible. It was just terrible, but it, it suited me. And the mess state of me all the time, I just couldn't believe that everybody else didn't want to be in this mess. It was only a bit about after a few months down the line where I was, was in a really dark, dark, dark place. But then, like with all those kind of things, you have an up day the next day, and then you're back again. Just completely got me, and I couldn't believe. I mean, like now when you have children yourself, you think, how can my mum... Not seen. That's and, why. That's yeah. why I'm asking you because you you're in a different place now. My and kids you, are just they're just not not they just don't do stuff like they just never have you know and I'm sure even if they'd have tried it it just wouldn't it wouldn't be an issue if when they when they have the first if anybody smoked I caught them the first time they smoked I catch them I can smell alcohol on them from a mile away you know yeah. if, when they were fourteen it's not happening it's not happening you know and there's no violence in my house but it's not happening. Good things don't happen, you know. You're not back in school; they cannot stay off school. They were, if you stay off school, you t- I take the plugs off the television. You're not going to sit and watch television like I would have sat and watched television. See, because you know, already. you're yeah. a warden. See, but you're and a also, warden. I'm, because I'm a singer. I'm I'm not going to work nine to five. Like my mum would go to work nine to five, so I'd be home. I'd know if they're off school. There's no staying off school, being having a nice life. Because I just never went to school for the last year, hardly ever. I only went in for one teacher because she gave me lots of love support confidence mrs roach gave me everything and made these musicals around me incredible and you know and, and she said what's wrong with you she was one who was going what's wrong with you? she knew something was wrong she'd look in my eyes and i think she can tell i've glue sniffed so i wouldn't go in for a week because i thought she knows and um and she would she could have sorted me out unfortunately my mum should have feel bad on my mum but you know, I do love her. I'm very, very close now, obviously. Um, see her almost every day and make sure she's okay. Because you don't know what she's been through, because she didn't get loved the way she should have to be honest. Why, you know? This is what I'm yeah. saying, that waterfall yeah. effect. That's what I said course, before. Yeah. We need to understand what's the top yeah. of the waterfall, what's yeah. leading down and try to try to stop it for the next lot as well. Yeah. Because so, this is what you always hear trouble in the home is what causes us to reach out somewhere else to look for what we feel we are missing. Of course, it's natural to do that. Yeah. That's why I needed you to explain it. I've the- never done, I've never, I've never yearned for money at all or things like that because I've always, my mum, to be honest, she used to, I used to say, I want a pair of shorts in every color because I love this pair. She would get me a pair of shorts in every color. They wouldn't be expensive shorts. But she would buy me them in every colour. My dad would come at Christmas and give me, sometimes, and so, you know, some years, he'd come and give me a big cheque because he hadn't seen me for a year. My dad from Nigeria would come over and give me a, a cheque that was like, wow. And really, it should have been for my mum. But she would let me have that cheque. So money I didn't really suffer from. I did just used to get whatever I wanted. But then I said to my mum, money can't buy, that money's, you can't buy that thing that I need. You can't. Just, and I asked her not to do it to my children, you know, don't just give them money, you know, because it's that's not how it works. You just want, I just want you to love, love us. That's all, just love. Was your father also um, educated from the English system or from the Nigerian system? Nigerian, but then he came here for university to Manchester to study civil engineering, and that's where he met my mum at a wedding. So he was here just for the... He was here for as long as his course lasted, really, and then he was going to send over for us. But like like a lot of them don't, it doesn't happen. But, yeah, no, I think he genuinely was, but he ended up meet, meeting um, a, a lady that I do love from the Bahamas, Ginny, who's, who's you know, she's been a lovely stepmother to me. And, um, yeah, unfortunately, we just lost my brother, Osa, on Wednesday. Um, I love very much my favourite brother. So, well, he was my favourite brother. Now Uyi is my favourite brother, if he's listening Aww. to the Bahamas. Because, you know, no, the one I just knew him best. I knew one I spoke to all the time, you know, and he's only in his 40s. So it's absolutely devastating to lose him. Um, but, yeah, because I haven't got any family apart from, you know, my dad's children. So it's, it's a shame. On your mother's side, there is no extended family. She had a child before me that was adopted, and but we're not close or anything. So, yeah, there's nobody else. And if there's no one, my grandma's gone. We don't really have a family. It's just, you know. Well, you oh, now you have your own children, of course, and they yeah, just me, yeah, and they don't have children. I'm just saying we don't have a big family. My daughter lives in London. My son lives around the corner. I see him every day, take him to work, and yeah. So I, I love. We've got a great relationship, and um, yeah. But I'm just saying we haven't got. You know, that's like Christmas Day. There's no family things, isn't any. So 
Yeah, they use, quite often they say, if I want to go away, I can go to a beta, I can go to Mallorca, I can go away on Christmas Day and be with my friends. But <laughs> I'm going to stay with my family this year. Good, good. Yeah. So now we also now on the timeline of Rowetta's life, we understand that part. So let's Love go on. To, <laughs> now let's go on to the 2000s now. So we know that you know we you, you're still you're writing, you're making records, and and now we understand that a lot of the house people wouldn't have known you because you were incognito in a sense, yeah. more in the pop market, more out of the sight. But your records are being sampled, your voice yeah. is being used. So you're going to have to explain what's going on in your life as you're watching all this unfold. And we know the voice happens. We know well, another show happens. There's a lot of things that are yeah. going on. Well, for the house music, what happened was I would walk in the Hacienda and I said, that sounds like me. This a different time, 89, 90. There, was no, you, there, was, there were no ways of getting somebody's voice off a record as far as I knew. And I was walking the Hacienda and say, that sounds like me. But how can that be? That's not the record. I said, that's my, I did a song, Reach Out. How, what song's this? And I could hear it. And you think you're going mad because it's like, I, you just don't understand. There's no way of Googling it either. There was no way of checking it out. There's nobody you could call. This was 1990. It's like a different world. So you just say to the DJ, what's that tune you just played? And this and the Hacienda. And they'd say, what? Which tune you go? The one that before, the one before, the one before that one. And it took me a long time to find out there was a tune, Eterna Slam, Slam Eterna. I think the band is Eterna and it's Slam. I think um, is it Slam by Eterna or Eterna. Anyway, this is the information I got. So a lot of people, it's one of their favourite tunes. From They sampled me but hadn't told me. So I, I didn't get it. I didn't know how it happened. And then Todd Terry, Lime Life, Baby Can You Reach? I heard that, but it's been speeded up my voice. And it's like, no, that's definitely me. So I'd say again to the DJ, what's this? And he went, Lime Life. Who? Lime Life. Never heard of it. No way I could look it up to find out it's Todd Terry. I didn't know. So it's just, it was just kept happening. This is 1990. And then I went off with Happy Mondays, forgot all about it. And um, yes, and then I realised that the um, when somebody, I, I didn't have a record of this reach out. What they did on the B side, they left the acapella on. And that's how people were sampling it. But I had no idea that they'd done that. So and now I'm glad they did because Black Eyed Peas used it. But, well, we'll get to that in a minute on Black Eyed Peas. Yeah, but I did, I, I'm saying when, when big names use it, then it was good. But back then, I was like, why did they leave that? Why did they leave the acapella on for people to... Then people think they can just take it. But I didn't even think you could do that. I didn't know legally if you could do it. I didn't know... How can people just bring out a record and not tell someone? They've used their voice. Right. I just, I, I just thought it was unheard of. It's not right. I, don't, I still don't know who these people are, some of them. Like, I know Todd Terry's Lime Life. He actually re-released that, Baby Can You Reach, just a couple of years ago and still didn't credit me. He's naughty. And I'm annoyed because I know him now. And it's like, he's just said him and Dennis Quinn. So who does the vocals, Todd? So anyway, so I did a tune with him after that, though, and he does backing vocals for me. On one of the tunes I've done. Todd did it. Todd sang the backing vocals. Backing vocals, and it's called "You Don't Know Me." You don't know me, and he does the backing vocals because I told him he sings like Luther Vandross. He's got a great voice, Todd, and I think he's done a few vocals since then as well. But yeah, he did the backing vocals on my "You Don't Know Me" after not crediting me on that tune again. But yeah, no, it's it's just imagine if people had known who it was though, and then I would have got to work with more people. Um, people would have known my name earlier. I wouldn't have had this big lull of nothing in my career if people would have known that you know who who sang what, who was on what. It, I just don't think it's right, and it's continued that and until more recently, where I've told people that's me and let them know it's me. But it's, there's a lot of tunes that I didn't know about, and it's only now that people, because of the internet, people all the time say, "Is this you?" and send me. So I'm getting now, I'm getting royalties for a lot of tunes that I have done well that I didn't know. And there's one by a guy called DJ Zinc, proper jungle. It's not really my kind of thing. I might not have even said yes to it, but I got a big check, a big, nice check for that one Christmas because it was me. And it's again, it's speeded up so, so it's like that. It's, I know it sounds like a, a cartoon. Yeah, Mickey Mouse. When Mickey you realise, when you get a nice big check, I think it's on five figures, but you go, 
Sample me again. Sample me again. Because nowadays, if you sample me, I'll find out and I will get the money. It might take years, but I will get what's mine. And it's a beautiful thing, it's, right? Beautiful on thing. some versions of Show Me Love, though, it keeps saying it's not me. And it's it just really, I, I just say, I'll just go into the PPL. Okay. I'll say, I will sing to you. I will sing it to you. Nobody's got my voice. Because if somebody tried to say on one of the remixes of Show Me Love, that they replicated my voice with a machine. And I said, piss off, which we say in England. Hang on. You can't. I know hey, my voice. Slow down. Slow down. I know I'm getting you, annoyed. <laughs> you, you were, your Swedish House Mafia comes to you. Or you got to tell the story of how that They didn't all, come to me. Yeah, well, so then, Steve, well, Angel, Steve Angel and Laid Back Luke, they made this tune called B, which is a big tune. And then they... They, they asked, could they use it with the other two guys from Sweet Mercy who I did reach out with? And they did a contract. And the contract, um, the two guys I did the tune with, they wanted it really in their favour. And, and Steve Angelo and Layback Luke wanted it very much, so we got hardly anything. So there was a, a split where they should have just said, let's make it equal, I think. I was thinking, well, the tune's doing nothing. It's just sat there. Nobody sampled it for a couple of years. Let it come out. We'll get the royalties from it. It's a, you know, everyone's buzzing over this white, white label of B. Um, Steve Angelo and Layback Luke are big names now. Let them do it. And anyway, the other two guys said no. They wouldn't sign the contract, wouldn't let them use it. So they were playing it everywhere. And I saw these videos on YouTube watching them playing to massive crowds with this tune as if, and that's when I saw Layback Luke singing my, as if it's, he's the singer. And I'm like, it's really upsetting me because they've been told they're not allowed to bring it out. I was happy for them to release it, but they weren't allowed to. So then I heard remixes of Show Me Love and they stuck my vocal on the beginning. You are at the top. I'm saying, can you reach? Can you reach? You can reach. And that sample. And the B, B, B. That's the sample. And they've left it on. And then it goes into Show Me Love. And no credit, no name doesn't say I'm on it. And so people think it's Robin S. And sorry, right. I'm, that's me just, that's just me singing a dead I, I, I can tell no lie, including me. I know. There's no mention of my name. And that's not fair. Let me and clarify that one more Steve time. Angelo. That record was huge, everybody, including Lenny said. I didn't know Robert. Until she told me, I, I was like, what? The other, the other thing, it's Robin S. Or they don't know who it is. And then, so it just doesn't mention me. And that's just not fair. And then I see on YouTube, on, on every version, it says featuring Robin S. Which should be Anne Rowessa. It really should, because the vocal at the beginning, and then Hardwell released um, a remix of it. And it was huge. And it got me a lot of money in the end. Hardwell released this, and he kept playing it all his gigs and singing the words, my bit. You are at the top. And then Swedish House Mafia started playing it, and still do. And that... And now they don't even use Robin S's vocal at all. It doesn't go into Show Me Love. It goes into something else. They're just, just using my B vocal, Reach Out vocal, and then going into other tunes. Benny Benassi is doing it now, and it goes into Satisfaction. It's fantastic what he's doing. He just did it at EDC in Vegas. And I'm like, wow. And when I said to him, I love what you've done with my vocal, I still don't think he knows. And he's like that. Thanks, lady. He should be going, is that you? He, he doesn't know. Like, no. lady. He doesn't know. You should say that's well, my... No. That's I said, my... Thank, thanks for using my vocal. I mean, he's going to know in a minute because I, I keep posting videos, it says, but he might not know it's me. So I put using Rowetta B vocal because I'm not I'm not asking for anything. I think a lot of these producers or DJs think I'm asking for something. I'm not. It'd just be nice to have a bit of credit. But the ones who play it like Benny, I love what he does with it. So I just want to go, thank you. But then uh, Duke Dumont did it at EDC Vegas, Electric Daisy Carnival, the other day as well. And so I said to him, oh, thanks for playing this again. And then he said, do you have any acapellas I can use to do a tune with you? And that's what happens quite a lot. And that's the best thing about when people play my tune and, I can, and, or, and my vocal. So it's, it's coming back to me now where I'm working with the people. So now I've sent him an acapella, um, Duke Dumont, and... Hopefully that'll be out. You know, he's, he's working on it now. So that, but that happens a lot. And it's, and then Oliver Heldens used it and said, he's with Tool Room. Can I use it? He's been trying it out. He sampled it, played it out, called it Rave Machine. And then I said, you can use it as long as you put feature in Rowetta or Androetta. And he said, of course. And he said, here's my number. If you ever have any problems with the label or anything else, 
just call me. Now, that's a superstar. That's a great producer who's no ego, not greedy. He said, here's my mobile number. It's a good job I don't fancy him. Because <laughs> I've been ringing him all the time. <laughs> no, he's gorgeous, though, Oliver Heldens. So I'm joking. But um, he's only 25, but he's like a genius. He's a kid and he's um, brilliant. So, yeah, and that was a big, that's did three million very quickly on Spotify during lockdown, which is amazing. Um, so, yeah, it's fantastic. But the Black Eyed Peas, when they sampled it. Well, that's okay now. Wait, wait. Before we get into Black Eyed Peas, I remember you mentioned about David Guetta playing it. Let's talk about that yeah. song. So, talk about He's, all that up until what happens to Will I. I, I have the radio on in my car. Boom, boom, pow. It's all over the radio all the time because it's a big hit here and in America. I think it was 2008. 2000, late? 2000, not 2008. Oh, no, no. 2000, 2000, 2009 is when, 2009 is when it was, I did sign the contract with them. So it's, yeah, 2008, 2009 when he sampled it. So I think it was the New Year's Eve of 2008 going into 2009. He said he heard it in LA. David Guetta played it at midnight or near midnight. And he said, got to get that. The vocal, it's the B vocal. And got to get that. And so he did. And he got it. I don't know where he, whether he got it off the B tune or if it's off the Hardwell remix or where he's got it from. Because David Guetta plays my vocal all the time, but he does all sorts of things with it. So I don't know what version he'd heard, but there is. then they'll find it's an acapella. So then Steve Angelo and Laidback Luke contacted Will I Am and said, you need to stop the album, The End, because they want record sales, because you've sampled B on Boom Boom Power, which was number one in America at the time and did was for 12 weeks. So they wanted record sales of the album, which was the number one album, The End. So they wanted the album stopped. So I get then, obviously, Interscope, with the label, and well, I am, they've panicked, contacted me and said, is this you on this record? Yes, it's me. I wrote it, I sang it. Do you have the rights? to the record because they have a problem because it's already out. So I need to give permission, backdate the permission. So that, so, that, so I agreed to all of that because I just thought they were out of order anyway, trying to get money. No, not, not even saying Rowetta should guess it either because it's my voice. They've got absolutely nothing to do with that vocal apart from they sampled it like everybody else did. They just sampled it on B. And it wasn't, didn't come out, wasn't released as a tune because they, they weren't willing to sort it out between themselves, the Eric's from this sweet mercy. And it's just like, I'm suffering here because it's not fair. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get nothing. I'm the one who's saying, bring it out. Everyone can bring it out. I'm not being greedy here either. I don't think it's bad for anybody for it to be released by anybody. The record was recorded in 1989. I don't mind if people sample it now because at least people are asking now a little bit and they're going to pay us. Let's understand the logic of this for a second. Yeah. Legally speaking. In yeah. 1989, when you did that, who did you do the contract with originally for that song? There was no contract, really. It was just a white label, and it came out on Boo, Bush, I think it was. These two guys, Eric Sweet Mercy, it was their own label it was released on. So there was no contract back then. It was just, I did it with two lads. So when they left the acapella on the B side, which I didn't know about, they, anybody who sampled that voice, it's just my voice, written by me, just my voice. But because it's on their label, and I'm fair anyway, I don't mind splitting it. You know, we recorded it together, but really it's only my voice for PPL purposes, radio plays. It's only me that's getting any money for it because it's only my voice on that a cappella. It's only me on it. They're not getting anything of that. But when I do any deals with that vocal, like I was going to do with Steve Angelo and Layback Luke, I will split it three ways with them. So with Boom Boom Pow, Will I Am contacted me, William Adams. With the co I split it. I asked them permission. Can we? And we split the check I got for doing it, the advance or whatever. What he did, he paid me because he'd already brought it out. And I agreed to say I've given them permission to use it at any point. And... So legally, I didn't really have to, I could have argued with them, but I don't want to argue with anybody and said, it's only me should have any money because he's only contacted me, but I'm not greedy like that. They've stopped it coming out well, so many times. In a court of law, no contract with them. It's your no. voice. Yeah, but it's did on their write, label. Did I you know. Write, well, I'm just saying, did yes, you write? I wrote you write, it, yeah. I yeah. have nothing. Your Honor, I rest I my case. 
So it's, when they so so Carl Cox wanted to, to use it a few right? years ago with head candy, right? And they said no. The guy said no. They said no to Steve Angelo and Layback Luke. So they keep saying no all the time. So then Greco from New York City, he wanted to release B. You've done a re loads of people mix this tune and use the sample and send it to me and say, can we use it? And I always say, you can have trouble with the other two guys. So this time I asked them, can this tune is getting really great reviews everywhere. Everybody's playing it. Kenny Dope's playing it with the Masters at Work. He's playing, Todd Terry's playing, Roger Sanchez. Everybody's playing this tune B. Please, can, you know, can we can we get this out and agree to it? They said no. So I said, well, I'm going to re-sing it. And that's what I did. So I re-sang the vocal because I've still got a great voice because I've stopped smoking as well nine years ago. So it's better than before. So if they're not going to give permission, anybody, if they're going to be, you know, they could have earned nice money out of that. But yeah, I'm not having them stopping it again. Guess I'm what? Them... What is their reason? They say, because I know you must have asked them. They want them. more money. They're not happy with the amount. That, you know when somebody's saying you can have 10%, 20%, they're not happy. With, the tune was done years ago. They're doing nothing with that tune. But yeah, they're just saying it's not enough. They want probably 60%. They want, they did it with Steve Angel and Layback Luke. Then the, Steve Angel and Layback Luke wanted too much and so did they. So it's like, whoever wanted 70%, I think they both wanted 70% and the others to get 30%. And I'm just in the middle going, just somebody bring it out and just make an agreement. They couldn't, they wouldn't agree to 50 50. No. Wow. No. And it, it, each time. So it's, um, yeah, just greed on our, each side. And so this time I just said, I'm redoing it. So then the other two guys were threatening to take Greco to court. I went, threaten him all you want. I've resung it. They're saying it's the same sample. Say what you want. I've resung it. It's exactly the same. I don't care. I can sing it exactly the same. I sing it live all the time. So, yeah, and it's speeded up a lot on some records and lowered for other records and for live. And when Swedish House Mafia use it, Steve Angelo's in it, and they use it all the time now. As I say, they don't use Robin S's voice anymore. They only use mine. But he does interviews about it and just never, ever, he just skips my name. It's like you using my, my voice all these years later do you think on these live shows now. Do you think there's a reason why they do that? Because I know I you must know. analyze this. You must have sat and analyzed this. Of course I have. No, it's what because it? they didn't get permission to use it in the first place. So oh, so they're afraid. afraid. They're afraid. Of yeah, they used it anyway because they shouldn't have used it. They shouldn't have released B anyway. They released it on some kind of white label, but it made quite a lot of money, I think. I don't want any money from it. I want to be credited. I get money anyway. But, you know, they could have made it a lot easier by just saying it's Rowetta. Instead, I've got to threaten. So I'm coming down to I'm coming down to the office. I'm going to sing it to people, and each time I I put a claim in for these remixes of Show Me Love, I have to put another claim in. Luckily, there's a, com a, a website called Who Sampled, Who Sampled, and they are yeah. amazing. And they've just given me a blue tick on there. And I'm a, and they've just done a, a big piece where they've interviewed me and everything because I've said to them they've helped me so much, and they understand because each time a remix comes out and I go, that's me again, and I have to prove it through Who Sampled, and then PPL will give me the money for it. So Who Sampled have been a blessing, and so I'm yes now I'm um I'm like a, whatever I'm on, I'm like one of the queens on. On who sampled? She's no, the queen really. bee on who sampled, baby. She's the no, queen. No, because no, no, because most people don't well, need to use who sampled, but I well, need it. Loretta, not only have you been sampled a hell of a lot. Yeah. Rochelle Fleming from First Choice has been sampled probably more yeah. than we can count on records. Lolita Holloway on South. Soul. Lolita Holloway is terrible. I mean, if eventually people knew it was her, but all them years she didn't get the life she should have had. And the credit she should have had, and the gig. Martha, Martha the gig Wash. Martha, Martha Wash, who I love. I've got lots of pictures of Martha Wash. I've been to see her a lot as well. Martha Wash, because Salado, her name's not mentioned on Salado's tune. I did a tune with Salado, but I made sure my name's mentioned because they're from Manchester as well. But that ecstasy song is, is um, Martha, Martha Wash. She's just incredible. She's got one of the bushes, and she's got one of the greatest voices ever. But, and every time I say, with the Salado tune, and this is Martha Wash as well. They always mention her and she always says thank you. She's such a gracious, lovely lady. But what they should be household names, these people, and they weren't always Lolita Holloway. And imagine the gigs, then the amount of money that some of these girls get paid that are recognized. Some of these, anybody, you know, like Fergie from Black Eyed Peas will get a fortune for any gigs. Me, I'm not going to get the same kind of money. Nobody knows who it would be. That's not fair. You know, the, the amount of gigs I could have had over the years, I'm getting gigs now better 
but also your fees, everything, and who you could have worked with because of it. And and it's really difficult not to be annoyed or not to be bitter, but I choose not to be. I try not to be. Well, if you're going to be bitter, you if you're gonna be bitter, then you're not going to work. You know what's going to happen. No, there's no point in being bitter. But I do try and make it not happen again. I try to make it less frequent. And, you know, it's, yeah, just not not getting upset about it too much because I do work. But it's just, it's just annoying because I know when and I do any house music festivals at house things, I'm people say to me, you're charging too little. I'm charging too little because I'm not charging too much like some of the other girls because your Robin S's are going to get much, much more because they know Show Me Love. But imagine being on some of the versions of Show Me Love that have been massive and they don't know it's, you know, they don't know it's you. They think it's her. It's, it's just unfair. And I met Robin S and I mentioned it and she, I thought she was going to bite the head off. Um, it didn't, yeah, she just um, didn't say hi and give me a hug or anything. It's a shame because I think she's brilliant. But um, and luckily, there's loads of new remixes of "Show Me Love" because that's what the world must need. I don't really pay that. I like new stuff personally, rather than keep remixing stuff. But it's good for me because they keep using my voice, so I'll keep claiming and getting um, my money. I'm getting help with it now, though. Somebody else. Is, I've been working with these guys called Who Are Amazing W H O. Um, they are fantastic, and they're doing they are. lots of stuff at the moment. So I've just been doing a lot of tunes with them. So they have a manager who's, who's helping me get all my claims in for all these tunes because it's a bit above my head. I've been doing it for years, but, you know, and he said straight away as soon as you look, there's 91 songs here that you're not getting your money for that you should be on. So I was like, right. that was just day one. So that's looking good. So, um, yeah, so I might come and visit you next year with all the, all the royalties. <laughs> But, you know, never know. What no, the hell um, makes you... Wait, now hang on for a second. What makes you go and jump in to do the voice out of nowhere? Like, yeah, I know the, the voice... Said, yeah, I mean, sorry, X Factor. You know, y y I know it's gone, but, you know, again, here you are already claim to fame, you're known. How do you yeah, take a yeah. step back? And it's a good step back, but also kind of funny how it plays yeah, out. Yeah. What makes well, you jump in... This is those years where I've not really gone into after two that after doing the twenty four hour party people, there's another gap. So anyway, I wasn't doing much. But my uncle Michael, who I mentioned earlier, was blind and deaf. His wife died, and sign language for blind and deaf is different for people. A lot of people can do one kind of language for people. Um, but if you can't see, it's like there's deaf language, but deaf blind, a lot of people can't do the sign language. But I've done it since I was a kid because his wife used to look after me when my mum was at work. So I've done R O W I can just do sign language. So I looked after him with my mum when his wife died, and that was 2002. So I was looking after him with my mum and being a mother and doing bits of singing. But um, then 2003, he died, and I was doing nothing. I realised I've got no gigs. Just coming up to Christmas, I'm doing nothing. And then there's an advert on TV, and I love Simon Cowell on American Idol. And he used to think, oh, my God, he'd love me. He'd love my personality. He'd love my voice. I'm just, what a shame I'm not 25 in American because on American Idol, he would love me. But because I'm older, I wasn't um, young enough to go in for any of these. I've never even wanted to do the talent competition over here. But it just at the right time, I was doing nothing. And my grandma just said, there was something on TV and she said, you should have your own show like her. You know, everybody said it when you were young, you should have a show like Shirley Bassey. You're that kind of singer. But I said, yeah, but Grandma, I met me ex-husband, you know, this different kind of life. I couldn't do that in the end. That's what I wanted probably when I was 15. But then it didn't happen because of my life. Um, yeah, the, and those shows, those variety shows, they're not the same anymore. They're more for older people. But um, she didn't like Happy Monday. She didn't get it. She didn't like the house music. She's my grandma. She wanted me to be famous on my own TV show and, and that kind of famous, like a Diana Ross or, a, you know, an Aretha Franklin, anything. The way she'd heard of her, everybody, all her friends had heard of me. So um, then the advert came on, Simon Cowell said, any age, you can be any age. I don't know, there's a singing show. And I was like, hey, wait, my Uncle Michael's just died. My grandma's just said she wants me to be where she can, you know, before she passes, she would like to brag to her friends, this is my daughter, uh, the granddaughter. And um, it just came at the time and I just thought, I'm not going to tell anyone. I'm just going to go and audition and um, not tell anyone. I didn't even know who the judges were apart from Simon Cowell. And so I got the application and I thought I won't even go. And then I just, I thought, you know what? I'm really going to need a drink to do this. And I did. I just, I got on a train because it was in Leeds. There wasn't one in Manchester. Got on a train, didn't tell anyone. And then you have to go through loads of researchers. You don't go and see Simon. It's a long, long day of different researchers and cues and stuff like that. I thought, oh, this is hell. I was going to come home loads of times. People recognising me. 
the assistant researchers were saying, aren't you in the Happy Monday? Weren't you in the Happy Mondays? And I'm like going, no. And then and then someone went, you're already famous. You can't do this. And I went, no, because Simon won't know Happy that's, Mondays. That's yeah. right. That's what I'm thinking. So yeah. there's a lot of people and the Happy Mondays were a big band. So it was like I was keeping trying to keep my head down. And then I was making friends during the day and stuff. And then um, I got through at the end of the day, but it was a long, long day. And you still hadn't seen the judges. So the next time I thought, I'm not queuing up ever again. So I booked a hotel room the night before. And then this time I just walked down the stairs and picked up a number in front of the queue because I, I stayed the night in the hotel. Had a drink with the researchers the night before who were the Happy Mondays fans. Got to know them a bit. And then um, they just told me Simon and Sharon and Louie don't come till the afternoon. So um, I tried to pace myself. And then you'll be seen at two o'clock. So I was all ready to sing at two o'clock. And Simon had put in his book, the hardest song to sing is Bridge Over Troubled Water. So he said, so I thought, well, I know I can sing a great version of that. And that's why I had it all prepared. Um, and then I walked in um, at two o'clock and it wasn't the judges again. It was some researchers again. So I went to the shop across the road, bought a bottle of whiskey, started to drink because my nerves were going. I stopped smoking for five months and started smoking again because I'd never been nervous of singing, but I was nervous. And then I had this terrible audition where I blacked out almost. And um, it's, it, it's good I did it, though, because it made people remember me. And even now, it was, they were saying, there's that mad woman off the telly, instead of, that's the girl from Happy Mondays. People were saying, she's mad. Because she's a mad girl, the mad girl. Yeah, I spoke for 19 minutes without stopping. I've seen, and like Simon <laughs> loved it because he's going, this is great TV. And like, but really, it's like, I was saying, Sharon, you know what it's like to be married to a heroin addict? And I want, I've, I've, uh, Simon, I love dogs, but they won't let me show you. They won't let me turn my phone on. I can't remember any. I was just going on and on because I sang Bridge Over Trouble Wall. So I started to sing it and he went, have you got any more songs? I said, why? What was wrong with that one? And he said, just what I need to know because somebody had just got through apparently with Bridge Over Trouble Water, a three girl, um, these three sisters, my friend's voice of his soul. So that's why he needed another song for the, for the television show. And I thought, have I done something wrong? What, I've practiced this song. So then I started singing 700 songs, two lines of, of a Lady Marmalade, Circle of Life, anything I thought Simon would like. I was just doing loads and loads. And I just looked like this mad woman. And, um, but I got through eventually. But it, it just looked like a very mad audition. And um, I stormed out at one point because Louis, one of the judges, he said it was dreadful. So I walked out, but I'd left my handbag. So I had to come back, get my handbag. And then Sharon said, no, no, we don't think you're dreadful. We don't think you're dreadful. You're just mad, she said. So when they, when they say that you're mad, and everybody did think I was mad on the TV. But then you hadn't really heard me sing on the audition. Then it was amazing what happened. But what do they mean, the what they mean by, by them? We don't think you're mad. Like for the American perspective, what what, what is like, that? Yeah, like you you not not right in the head. Like gotcha. you're, um, yeah, because I was really erratic and really because <laughs> I mean, I was just it was just a weird situation. I've never done I've, <laughs> I've never done anything like this before. And I was putting I was saying to them, I'm not. This is everything. If it's going to go on television, this could ruin me, and I don't get through. I've not told anybody. Everybody's got the families with them out there. I'm there on my own. But I've got a lot at stake, and it, you realise, and then I went, I did, and the, oh, God, imagine if I don't get through when I get here. Oh, God. Oh, God. So it's just, my head was going mad. And if you watch it, I don't want people to watch the audition, but it's on YouTube somewhere, and it just, it's just mad. And I had to hide behind the sofa when it came on the television. And then, but Simon was going, the nation are going to love you. And then, obviously, boot camp and everything. It's, it was a beautiful story. It makes me cry because... He asked you to tell you the worst thing that's ever happened to you, something like you would do now, but you're in front of everybody. And so you, I said to him, you already know I've had a, I had a bad bit, bit of a bad life because I told you in the first audition, please can I just sing my song? And he says, no, Rowetta, part of the reason you're here is because of your personality. And, but I don't really want to share my personality with the world and make my down bits. Please, I said, can I just sing? And he went, Rowetta, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you? So I thought, what can I say that won't get used? So I said, being bent over a chair and threatened with anal rape by five men after being injected with cocaine and heroin. A speedball, I said. And he actually said to Rich, the producer, can we, can we use any of that? I was like, because I, I, was, I wasn't dry. I said the most, the worst thing in every line I could say that they can't use. Because anything they use, my kids, my kids were still just at school. They were the last, you know, 16, 17, but the college and stuff. I didn't really want them to be. Enough was the first audition. So I just said something I knew you couldn't use. And afterwards, luckily enough, I got on with Simon very well. 
And he went, we wouldn't have done that to you. I went, you did. You, I said, you say, can we use any of it? Because they don't care about you the same way. But it's, it was just fantastic for me because, I mean, I ended up singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow, which I wouldn't have chosen, but you're given a list of songs you have to sing. And that's when it all changed because people went, oh my God. And he went, oh, he would have me singing everything. He loved my voice. He just wanted me to sing around him all the time. And, and I sang whatever he wanted me to sing because, you know, he wanted me to get a good gay following. And, and so he'd get big, big, big gay icon songs. And it worked for that show. Um, and I'm really proud because it's such a challenge to do that show with all of the publicity and the stress of that. And you've got to live in a house with everybody else and, and away from, you know, away from my dogs mainly um, for nine weeks. And to be out of all the women in the country that entered with all the people going, because I hadn't been famous. They're only saying that because they'd heard of Happy Mondays. A lot of people didn't know the band that well. You know, it's, it's, it's we're a... Um, you either like Happy Mondays or you don't. It's not. We're not like. It's a, not like you know, saying not, the Rolling. It's not like saying Mick Jagger and the Rolling no, Stones. Exactly. I, mean, I didn't. I didn't even. I didn't sing with Happy Mondays. Is more of in Manchester, well known, but it's not like I get. Mo you get mobbed everywhere. It's not that kind of band either. And this was a nineties. We had a big, big hit in the nineties. And yes, we still sell out tours. That's great now because it's because we've reformed. Though we've had years out of the. You know, it's a different kind of band. And the audience for X Factor aren't really the Happy Mondays ones. You know, Happy Mondays fans don't sit and watch on a Saturday night, that kind of show. It was a challenge of the songs I was singing as well, because I oh. literally had to wear I had to wear what Simon told me to wear. And, you know, and luckily we didn't have to do dance routines or silly things. But as I said, I got on with him so much, gave me so much confidence as well. And the fear of whatever I was frightened of before, which we were talking about in the 90s, uh, this really, it just gave me, I just thought, I'm not going to not do interviews and not do that. I'm going to push myself. I, I, I decided once I did the X Factor, though, not to do any of that. And I wanted my privacy. I don't want people to know where I live. And I'm not going to do, they said £20,000 to do with one of the big magazines here. Because I was the top woman in the X Factor. Can we do At Home with Rowetta? And I decided no, because then... People, my son lives, still lived with me. It's not fair to say this is where we live. And I don't want to, my ex or anybody else, to say, let's go and rob her, let's go and find her. Let, I don't want his friends to, you know, it's, I, I don't like that kind of, you know, unless you, I don't know, a football player where everybody knows, I don't know. I just, I just didn't want to do it. So what they said was, we'll give you double the amount of money and we'll use somebody else's house. We'll use a house in London. Well, that's lying. You know, and it, it's just everything I'm not, I'm, everything I'm against. To pretend that somewhere's my house as well. What's the point? You know, I just, no. So, um, yeah, so I, I decided to not do that, not do any reality shows, apart from the Celebrity Rehab, which paid really well. And as I said, I knew nobody would really watch. Apart from that, I'd only do stuff for charity. I did Children in Need. Um, Children in Need with the BBC Philharmonic, uh, straight after The X Factor. And I work with the BBC Philharmonic a lot. Because I work with, for some reason, orchestras ask me to sing with them and it happens again and again and again. And what a great honour. And I've sung at the Royal Albert Hall in London quite a few times with an orchestra with Manchester Camerata, done Glen Eagles with them. So, yes, I have these, I do happy Mondays, but I also sing with a lot of orchestras. So that all started really because of the X Factor, because these people would see me not just as a house music singer or a, you know, so I get to sing with these orchestras. It's amazing though. And that's yeah so it was worthy and also for the gay following i've absolutely loved doing all the prides um as I, I stopped doing as much but i did all the prides um after the x factor which was fantastic it was like i'd won i did jay the night of, that I got kicked out kelly osborne announced me with sharon osborne at the side of me she's our winner she's our winner she's like that and um yeah no, um, i've always loved i've always loved the osborne's they've been very when supportive. you when you got to the finals i know in american idol there was some talk on this side of the world that you had to sign when they got it down even before you had to sign a recording contract or have it give them the first right of refusal was that part of that deal with the voice as well that if it's you the want... x factor is the x factor though not the voice but i'm sorry yeah, we, the x -factor. yeah I, I well i signed i signed everything and uh, and also um a clause where i'm not allowed to talk about anything at the time i don't care though i talk about what i want simon as i said i go on with simon but i signed all that before the show before this before i even got into the yeah when you get i think it was yeah after i've done judges houses which you do after we did judges houses and you've been the final 10 maybe uh yeah the final 10 that's when you sign your life away really and go yeah you give them because they but they said the, the only win 
the winners, the, the year I did it, the very first year, the whole point was only the winner would get a recording contract. Nobody else with Simon. Nobody else. That was the deal on the X Factor. It was winner takes all on the first year. And it's a good thing, really, because otherwise I love being a puppet of Simon for nine weeks, but I wouldn't really want it in real life. And I started to say no a little bit because after week five, I think, I've done all these songs. Like the first week, I didn't like the song, didn't like what I was going to wear the second week and stuff. But I was wearing it and doing what he said. But then he said, Celine Dion, when I was young, I never need... I'm not a Celine Dion type of singer. She's a brilliant singer, obviously. But I think somebody in American Idol did it and, and they ended up winning. So he thought it would win me the show. I didn't want to do a song with the first line when I was young. Because that's saying I'm old. And whatever songs you do in that show, I'm going to have to sing them for ages. And I was like, so I said no to quite, I ended up um, doing When You Tell Me That You Love Me by Diana Ross in the last show, because I was begged to sing it. And I don't really like the song. And you imagine how many weddings I was asked to sing it at. And it's like, oh, I don't want to sing it. Because it, it's with you for a long time, whatever songs you're cho choosing. Yeah, they get married to you. They become part yeah. of your life. Yeah, the, oh, it's just not. So they're not me, and it's like Celine Dion is fantastic, but you know, it's it's just not me. Um, so I said no. Um, and he said, "Oh, don't do this to me, Rosa. I'm at the airport. I'm about to go on a plane." So he was doing American Idol as well at the time, so he had to find a song for me quickly so we could work on it instead of that Celine Dion song. And I said, "Just let me do a disco song, please. Let me do Donna Summer, please. Let me do Donna Summer." And he went, "Oh, let me have a thing." I went, "Let me do because I did Donna Summer last dance at the boot camp." It went down really well. Anything like that on the radio, anything. So he said MacArthur Park. And honestly, I was like, nope, not that one. <laughs> not MacArthur Park, because nobody will get MacArthur Park. <laughs> you know, because it's an, a different kind of audience. It's Saturday night audience, family viewing, housewives. You need to give them something dead easy to enjoy and vote for. MacArthur Park, they'll all go, what's it about? What's that? No, Rowetta, sort I've of decided it's MacArthur Park. And he got on a plane and I had to learn MacArthur Park. And I did it, I got through, but I was like, I was, there was a break so I never got in the bottom two and I was like I'm going to get in the bottom two and it'll be your fault I was swearing at him you did this on purpose you want me out what's wrong with you and then he said after the break if you'd have heard her during the break oh my god and so somebody said what's it about because we had complaints uh, when they asked me what it was about and I said well somebody told me I can't say it on television but it's about spunk <laughs> And then somebody from the lip, British Lip Reading Society to complain because they could read me saying spunk. Yeah, oh yellow God. cotton dress foaming like the waves. So somebody told me that was spunk. Spunk? So he's, you cut semen. So saying that on a Saturday night show, I whispered it and someone yeah, said it just causes problems, stuff like that. But I don't think I'm really Saturday night, Saturday night viewing anyway. <laughs> live, live. No, I mean, no. I'm, I'm not a swearer, but I'm, I'm, like Simon said, it was like I got Tourette's. He was a bit worried about the live shows. I don't swear, but it's like you just say what you think, and it's not really a filter. But it, I'm not a swearer. I just, I just really say what's on my mind. And I think I wish everybody did really. It's, if you've got a kind heart, though, I always think there's no problem with doing that. You well, if you say, from, well, that's the thing. If you say it from your heart and not your brain. It's, a, yeah. it's more acceptable. Because then you wouldn't say something hurtful to hurt anybody, which I don't. I just, I'm just quite honest, but not in a hurtful way. It just, it's usually hurting myself, if anything, or, you know, messing things up for myself because I'm being honest. But um, I really, I'm at an age now where I really just don't care enough about um, damaging myself by saying something. Because as I say, I've got a really good heart. I don't mean bad. And the people who know me know that. And if people don't see through that and think I'm bad, then that's fine with me. They're not my kind of people. Wow, Rowetta, that's incredible. An incredible story. I'm so glad yeah. you shared this. Oh, my God, even in detail. I didn't in know. I thought it was going to be about house music, true house stories. True house oh, stories. Wow. No, true house stories. I'm going to watch all your back catalogue of stories. I'm definitely watching David Morales. But um, no, I can't. I'm going to watch really what Because I was watching your Wednesday one. I love that. I really, I just love you anyway, honestly. And um, but my really last, my show. last important question from here to forward, what's yeah. the vision for you now? What is the vision? Well, it's, it's to carry on as I was, because during lockdown, I worked with all the producers, but there was no dance floors, there was no clubs open. So I just, I want to perform the songs that I've been writing, and just, just if I keep doing that, I'd be happy write and work with some amazing talented people like-minded in the music they're just passionate about the music 
You know, these people who say, oh, I need a vocal redoing it. I'm just not happy with that one. I love people like that in the middle of the night. They can't sleep because there's one word they want me to re-sing. And they know that my microphone is all set up. And you, they know they'll have, I'll have it with them within an hour because my life is music unless I'm out or I'm at a gig. And I just want to keep being like that and having this enthusiasm and this love for music and this passion. Because honestly, now that after the lockdown, I don't need anything else apart from my dogs my friends no i don't have a big family or anything but i make friends anyway in gigs i just need to gig all the time to sing and you know and and i I just i'm happy doing all that everything else is a bonus in my life music is you know when people say music's everything it's not really music it's the whole of of, of it's my life it's it's um because it saved me definitely you can say it saved me during lockdown it saved me certainly after my ex-husband and all that because what would have i don't know what i would have become if i that was just it's like a gift from nowhere because nobody in my family does it so where's the musical talent come from i don't know i mean some people might go she hasn't got a nice one they might not like it but it's one of the most sample voices and it's from i'm not a gospel from a gospel family I've never sung, never been encouraged. You know, I'm lucky I've got a voice after all the glue sniffing I did as a kid. But, um, you know, I've given up smoking now. I did that as a gift to myself nine years ago. I gave up because I'd never smoked weed, but I always smoked cigarettes, a lot of them. I used to always have a cigarette. All the pictures of me on, at Sound Factory on stage, I've got a cigarette in my hand. Always had a cigarette in my hand. And um, I really loved that gig, though. Again, I loved that gig at Sound Factory. Is Sound Factory still open? No, that was long oh, gone. That's I long thought gone. so. Yeah, I thought so. Like every, other, Mark. like every other club in New York, they're all oh. gone. Oh, it's a shame. That was it. Was just it was just brilliant. Yes, Studio Fifty Four. Though, what was that like? I, I, that was I crazy. That I don't was think crazy. anywhere can compete with what we think it must have been like. Because you know, do you know what I mean? When somebody says, "What's the best club?" That's got to it was it, that must have been. Is that the best club you've ever? Pretty much, but also yeah. more than that for me it would be Paradise Garage, oh, me, because the music was out of control. That was and the and and some of the people I knew were, it just that was the creme de la creme sound system, everything. It's just uh, and that's what Ministry of Sound is born from, from the right. Paradise Garage. So I didn't know that. But you guys, for whatever reason, I mean, I was blessed to play Hacienda as well. Um, yeah. You've all been able to keep this club thing going forever and ever. It's crazy. It's wonderful. I love it's it. It's fantastic. I know. It is. It is. And I love the Defected and Glitter Box and all those nights now. The Because the, 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 you people like your masters at work and it's, it's just great that they're not just doing these young because the young djs yes they're doing well all these superstar new djs and then you've got your tiesto and david Guetta and all that lot but i love that you know like todd terry and roger and and masters at work and everybody and the glitter box nights are my favorite because of the music because to me it's all about the music rather than the all the all the other stuff you know and the dancers and everything i love but it's mm-hmm. just yeah i think as as, as well because i'm getting older i want i want good music i want to i want music to make me dance not a load of music that all sounds the same, which a lot of the music does in some of these. Te- I mean, I sing a lot of techno tunes. I'm not knocking it. Well, but, um, yeah. a lot of the tunes can I be very, to, very similar. I saw. I mean, I know Armin van Buren. I, I've, I've spoken yeah. to him. You know, I know him. He's a nice man, and yeah. he's a talented trans guy. But I watched in America. They had a stage set up, as you know, like an event, yeah. and everyone. It looks like an altar. He's doing yeah. his thing. And everybody in the crowd had a phone. Oh, no. And oh, I was horrible. And I was going, but where is the the dancing? No. Where well, is God? We had that back then because I hate where is this, where is the, you know, everybody, where's all that? I'm like, they're all like this. I swear. If this is a know. phone. They do it, they do it our gigs now. I know, I know. And I don't mind. Just, I don't mind on a couple of songs. You usually only do it. Well, so much right. like you're saying. I've seen it with Carl. Cut. They hold the phone all night till the battery goes. What the hell are you doing with it? Okay. Do, so what are we going to do later with all this film? What are we doing with this? You're playing it I back. Ah. Some of them are doing live Facebook to prove they're there. I think, but I don't get it. Hang Why? On. And also, also, it's everything I'm against as well because yeah. <laughs> no, but it's terrible because. You shouldn't let those people on Facebook watch the gig. If you've paid money to get in a gig, you should pay money to go to a gig or watch well, it. Well, like, and correct. dance and enjoy yourself. Oh, 
I forgot they all took, about the phones. You oh. see that? I was just saying, I'm like, I saw this and I was going to write something and I said, I can't write because it's me writing it. It's not the I right time. That. And I know Armin and I give a lot of respect to Armin. Yeah. But I'm just saying, I know what Armin's doing and I know that, and the music he's playing is high energized trance. Yeah. And I'm thinking they should be jumping around like rabbits. I know. But they're all like this. <laughs> they do all of it. And who took the video was Roland Clark and Roland Clark hanging with Armin Van Buren. And I could see Roland panning the camera around. I'm going, holy <laughs> smokes, what is this? It's just this horrible that like, not people are dancing. Music I felt like, like, I dance felt like dance they were doing scene. this. It looked like, it looked like at first <laughs> everybody was doing, but then I saw the phones and I'm like, oh mm -hmm. my God, this is crazy. It's horrible. I'm just glad we had it before because it's horrible now. I don't enjoy nights I like that. I as a DJ, yeah. as a record producer, now I'm in the media side of the business, okay? I get very stressed if you're not dancing. Yeah, exactly. I, exactly. It stresses me because I don't feel like I'm doing what I was hired to do. But you are. It's just it's something wrong with people now. They've got to prove that where they are. When, it's prove? It's just, what do you it's prove? Like prove? Well, what, what else is a camera for? Because, you know, we put, my first gig in Ibiza with Mondays was at Cool Club, which is privilege. There are no photographs. The only photographs are some blurry ones because someone's had them developed. There's no photographs of this night, 1990, with Paul Oakenfold DJ and Happy Mondays playing. All there is is a poster. So if you weren't there, you don't know what it was like because there's no hey, pictures. I love that. I, love I played that. at Manu, I played in Manu Mission. You didn't have a camera yeah, in that room. No, thank I God. Manu you. Mission. Thank I played that room. God. They're my friends now. We, uh, we, uh, we're Manu Mission are coming back. No, I did, I did New Year's Eve with them in Barcelona a couple of years ago. And it's like so different. We did 99. The opening party lasted four days. The Manu Mission. <laughs> yeah, Can know. you imagine if there were cameras? Can you imagine if there were cameras, though? We'd be ruined, everyone, people, not me. I mean, imagine the people that would be busted, the wives, the husbands. Oh, but God. Also, I mean, oh, and the, oh, people are being jailed for all sorts. Oh, God. Well, I'm, like, I'm not even going to talk about some of the... <laughs> but what fun it was, because there was none of that now. Oh, you, I mean, I can't go shopping. I'm not more, I'm not Beyonce. And I can, it's like, or if I'm on a train, people are rude to wake you up because they think they recognize you. They'll prod me to wake me up on a train because they want a selfie because they think you've seen your face on something. And you just, and you can't be angry because they'll video you saying piss off or something. They will you video wank? you. Get away from me, you wanks. <laughs> and they'll say, What's your name again? What's your name again? So, and it's like, yeah, I'm asleep on the train. And you say, it's Rowetta. That's it. That's right. You tell me. That's right. That's who you are. That's Leave right. Me. We you're trying knew to it. Fly. We knew I'm it. Trying to it. Leave me. I'm asleep in the train. Yeah, they just, they need to take a picture in case you're famous. Piss off. Oh, anyway, Rowetta. that's life now. I'm glad we had it before, though, because... You know, life before was so much. People don't. I went to dinner down. with a friend of mine from the business, and we were talking about that same thing. We danced our nights away like crazy, exactly. 12, 13 hours. Where is that now? We were all saying. Terry what Dolly is was this? saying it the other day. The way the, the when you didn't have to see the DJ all the time. I, I was wonderful. It was, it was better. I thought it was it always was better. Much better. It was much better. It was about the music, which it should be. And you would listen to the music more. And I still enjoy places where there are still clubs here that are like that. They're not big clubs. They're not always packed. But as you know, you want enough people there to enjoy it. But I enjoy them nights so much more. Um, but, but I've got a lot of friends that make a lot of money doing what they do, your salados and everything. There's a room for that. And there's a room, for, but it's, it's just not for me. I, I'm only doing that really backstage now, or side of the stage, uh, or singing. But um, yeah. Rowetta, you were a real treat. You were a real treat. And oh, also, you have, you're a diamond. Really therapy. I'm gonna, no, this has been like therapy. I'm so going to say I don't need therapy now. <laughs> no, you've been amazing. Thank you. I hope to meet you one day. You I will. hope to meet you one day. Here or there, but somewhere. Oh, no, Tenerife. I'm going to look at your dates. Make sure you post your dates. Tenerife in January, because I always have my birthday, but we have a gig in Amsterdam on the 8th. My birthday is the 5th, so I might do my birthday the week after in Tenerife. I'm there between the 14th to the 21st. Terry Farley's coming to a bunch of Amazing. people. I just did a tune with Terry. We just did a tune. 
Um, yep. Yeah, um, oh, it's called Bang. Yeah, we did it. Have a listen to that if you can. Terry, I will. Terry, if you're yeah, listening, yeah. Terry, make sure you send it to me because I am there. I am their scoop. Hang on, I'm their scoop reporter for New York, but I'm their correspondent in New York. When they need to get New York stuff done, they call me. I give them because all the editorials. His, his, his mix with Pete Heller, his mix was the one that Frankie Knuckles played of Happy Mondays. That I, I know. Believe that I know they that. Knew I, they knew my voice off this tune. I was like, "What well, Happy Mondays people think of it with the other voice as well?" And it's like, "Yeah, there, but you really want there, but you really want hey." Yeah, just that's like from nineteen ninety two. Let me tell you something. That was incredible in New York. That club, and not only that, that was when Frankie Knuckles was the resident DJ. Oh. Him and Junior Vasquez, Junior left, and they brought Frankie in for that time for like the six oh. or eight months. And you came to do that gig. I remember around when you were here that time. I remember when yeah, you. Yeah, it's amazing. It was one of my New favorite, certainly my favorite American gig ever because it was just it's the most memorable. Well, yeah, I'm going to tell like, you something. Look, yeah, it was filmed something. though. Yeah. Frankie Knuckles and Sound Factory to me felt like the closest thing to what Larry Levan and Paradise Garage was with the house oh, wow. music scene. So you caught you caught something that was a synergistic moment of what was the, right the time. 80s was like, but with Frankie now at the helm in 1990 at the at the Sound Factory. Wow. It was just a, it was just you caught it, you were it was at just the, amazing. Right, right, the right time. And Delight, just before Delight got big with Bootsy Collins on stage with them. Oh, they what were supporting us. They were supporting that? us. Proof is in the heart. Oh, tune. Amazing. Oh. But everybody's yeah. waving to you and they're saying, please come see us in Tenerife. We love you, Rowetta. Oh, everybody's I'm, I'm going to come to Tenerife. I love it. Because we were supposed to do the Ibiza Hard Rock and it. And it because the lockdown, it got cancelled. Me and my friend Bez were supposed to do it. So I would love to come. I'd say, oh, stay, oh, stay at Hard Rock as well. So I've come. And to wherever you're playing in Tenerife, I'm going to come and find you. All right. No, we'll, no. It's a day, and that's it's a my good birthday week. It's my birthday week. So I, I just love Tenerife for that. The we're going to sort something. So. We'll get you sorted out. Don't worry. Everyone, right. we want to thank, don't leave us, Rowetta, because we want to thank you. But everyone around the world, I want to say thank you for tuning in on your Sunday and giving up your Sunday to listen to one of our diamonds in the industry. Tell us the truth on True House Stories. She held nothing back, oh, as promised. <laughs> she said it all, which thankfully I can't thank her enough. Oh, my God. What a great insight interview. And we just want to give you a piece of advice. Check your contracts, everybody, and have some good people around you. If you don't know what you're doing, get a lawyer because don't sign your life away. That's all I tell everybody. Again, <laughs> once again, thank you all for tuning in to True House Stories and have a great night. See you on Wednesday.